So, I'm pretty sure we all have gone to a zoo, whether if it was when we were a kid or last year or this year. Um, when I went to the zoo um, when I was a kid, I uh, looked at like this cage and I was like, that really sucks. Like that really sucks how an animal is just being trapped there, like the whole, his whole life, you know? Or, yeah. And as I started walking through the, the zoo, um, I saw these monkeys, okay? And they were being really, really rude to all the people that, was, that were watching them. And they started um, throwing stuff at people and like screaming and stuff. <laughs> and, and it was like, it was funny, but it was like, like, oh snap, like, we gotta go because they were like throwing stuff at us. And um, that just really got me thinking like, oh, like, like, why should we be keeping animals in cages? Like, obviously, they're gonna get mad and like start throwing stuff and like um, screaming and all that. And and um, so, so yeah. So today, I'm going to be talking about how animals are being mistreated in zoos. And um, so first, I'm gonna guide you through the history of zoos. Second, the evolution of it, and third, why we should not have animals being kept in cages. So during the 18th and 19th century, zoos were known as menageries. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's like that, and we were open to the public. In 1826, the London Zoo um, um, marked the first step in the evolution of modern zoo. But there were uh, major concerns about that. They didn't know how long they were gonna live. They didn't know much about their biology, about their um, eating diets, and about their, the amount of space they needed to um, roam around. Uh, so this is where people will start to realize that this was like a very bad idea because um, they, can't, they couldn't keep animals alive uh, very long. So this brings us to uh, the second topic, which is, this brings us to the second topic. Carl Hagenbach, a German merchant of wild animals, um, during the 19th century changed the way animals were being displayed. They, um, he created a a new environment for animals, and um, so first of all, he brought out a sculpture uh, to carve artificial rock out of concrete and created the first landscape of that type. So that landscape, we, um, um, that landscape we use today, it's like almost about the same that, that we have today in zoos. Um, this created an illusion for, um, animals, this created um, an illusion for animals to be in their natural habitat. So they really thought they were like in their natural habitat, but they really weren't. Um, so he opened up a zoo and it was called the Higginbacks Animal Park. Oh, like zoo park. Um, People stood on the outskirts of a ditch and just basically just looked at the zoo. There was no information like, you know, today's zoos, they have like information, it's like a stand like that, just, you just read it off. They didn't have that. They were just looking at it while the animals just like sitting down, laying there. Like there's no point of that. So that was the evolution of the zoo back then, that, that, that was like their zoo. Just looking at it, staring at it, and just moving forward. So, <clears throat> lastly, um, so when I was talking about the stand, you know how you just read it off, it gives you a bit of information. Yes, it does have educational purposes, but honestly, there's no point. Like, today we have Google, we have the internet, we can just like read that off from there. And just, you know, just get your information there. We don't have to go to a zoo 
you don't have to go like pay to go to a zoo just to read and just look at the animal, like, you know, just sitting there, like standing there. Um, uh, caged animals suffer from stress and boredom. Well, obviously they're gonna suffer from stress and boredom because they're, they're in a cage doing nothing. They can't really do anything except sit and scream. That's all they could do. Um, for example, just imagine us in a classroom and just have big walls like these and just people staring at you just from all angles. What, what can you do? You can't really do anything. You just sit down, you know, do nothing. You can't roam around because there's not enough space and like in zoos there's animals that have like this amount of space and they're like huge like for example like rhinos you know like they need more space just to roam around and be themselves um so this really has to be changed for animals Yes, there is um, different types of zoos. Like, there's just there's there's some one zoo where you have you're in a car and you drive around the zoo, and there's um, animals like roaming around freely. And I think we should have that zoo instead of like zoos being like zoos uh, instead of animals being kept in cages. You know, you know, like do like one step at a time. You know, and. I feel like the one, the, the zoo that you're in a car just driving around, looking at them, they could be themselves because there is enough space for that. And, and it, um, <clears throat> and it helps them be themselves. So, in conclusion, I would like to So, in conclusion, I feel like animals should not be in zoos at all. And we should really change the way animals are being displayed. And So Dust, what did you think? Um, <clears throat> kind of like how um, like use the story in the beginning, and then uh, the preview is like main points, like kind of what he was going to talk about. Um, he had no cards, but he kind of really, um, really didn't use them. And uh, in the end, he kind of struggled, so he might want to work on that. And then, yeah, just think of a better conclusion. But other than that, it's on our speech. All right, well, I kind of like the idea of the shared experience that you have at the beginning as an attention device. It's a long visualization that you go through about uh, what you saw at the one zoo that you went to and how you know, the monkeys were rude and uh, the other animals you thought uh, they were having problems. And I, I, I like the idea that what you're setting up here is a perspective on this. Um, but uh, when you get to the body of the speech, it starts to sound like you're going to give us an informative speech about... Uh, some of the problems that zoos have. You do finally, in essence, at the end of the speech, suggest that we ought to get out of the zoo business or that we ought to change the way in which animals are displayed in zoos. I, I think should be set up 
at the beginning of the speech so we know where you're headed. Uh, there is a preview, although I'm not exactly sure how the history of zoos and the evolution of zoos is going to be different. That sounds like it's kind of this, the same point that you're talking about. Uh, menagerie is the word that you're looking for, you're having a little bit of trouble with. Uh, the information about uh, the one innovator who created a new way in which the zoos might create uh, landscaping, Higginback, uh, that's an interesting side point. I don't know how it ties into the point that you're talking about. The notion that zoos have evolved over time, they've gone from places where people could just see animals that, that they were lucky weren't dead by the time they got a chance to see them because people didn't know how to take care of them or uh, make sure that they were going to live for a while. Um, I think that's okay that the zoos have uh, evolved and people have gotten a chance to see the animals and that we've learned a lot about the animals. I'm not exactly sure that you get anything out of that. It really feels a bit like you've got this, um, like I said, informative speech that you're laying out for us before you get to the part where there's an argument that says the problem is that animals uh, don't function well in these sorts of environments. By necessity, they're going to be bored. Uh, they are going to have problems because they are operating or living in systems that are not natural to them. And as a consequence, there's going to be some sort of problem. But I don't hear any evidence about what those problems are. I mean, my, it sounds to me like the worst thing that happens to the animals is they get bored. And you know what? Most humans get bored too, so how is that different? Why am I worried about you know, the fact that some monkey is bored or some tiger is bored when the, the truth of the matter is half of my class is bored on a daily basis? Uh, you need to give us a, a better argument here about what's going on and why that's a problem for the animals, that there's something cruel about it, that it hurts them in the long run, uh, that uh, if you want to make an evaluative judgment about the um, you know, immorality of doing that, that's fine, but you need to make an argument about it that says that that is in fact a, a problem. Um, it's a little confusing toward the end when you suggest that the, the animals could be displayed in one way, but then you kind of turn around and say, we ought to be getting rid of displaying the animals in any way, with any, anyhow, because we can see them on Google, and so why would we need to have uh, animals around to, to look at? I think you miss the big reservation argument is that uh, zoos are not uh, the menageries that once existed in circuses where people could simply stare and gawk at the animals, uh, that they are in fact uh, not just educational, but they're research facilities, and you know, people are going to be sitting there going, well, wait a second, aren't the zoos part of the process by which animals are being uh, kept from extinction? Aren't animals in danger in the wild because of encroaching uh, human activity or because of pollution and a variety of those sorts of things? And I thought that that's one of the things that zoos were doing is addressing those kinds of issues. But if we got rid of them all, wouldn't there be a problem? And I think that's a low-hanging example of, you know, uh, you know, a, a, ref, a rebuttal or refutation issue that you probably need to address in the speech. Presentation issues, you are just really uncertain. From the very beginning, you look uncomfortable. You've got your arms crossed the whole time you're speaking. Maybe it's because it's cold in the room, or maybe it's just because you feel a little bit indifferent, but it definitely is off-putting from the start. You don't really look at the audience very much. Um, when uh, Dust says you're not really dependent on the cards, that part's true, but you're not really engaging us, so that I think is a little bit problematic. Um, it looks at sometimes like you're chewing gum. Uh, you need to address the audience, try and engage us a little bit more, and you're not doing much of that. All right, thank you. Uh,